Good morning, and a warm welcome to Sunday worship here at Grahamston United Church. Uh, I've got one notice really for you, just to remind you that there's tea and coffee after the service today, and during which we'll also have one of our congregational meetings. So if you're able to stay behind, tea and coffee through in the hall. I'd also like you to welcome Richard Porter, who's preaching this morning. Richard is a student minister who's been placed with Fourth Valley Methodist Circuit. So he's here to gain some experience, and we're delighted to have you this morning, Richard. Hopefully you might tell us a bit more about yourself, but uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Can, can you hear me? Is the mic on? Is it working? Yes. Well, it's a joy and a privilege to be here with you this morning. Uh, uh, and My name is Richard Porter, and I am a, a Methodist uh, Presbyteral Minister just completing my penultimate uh, year at the Queen's Ecumenical College in Edgebaston, just south of Birmingham. My wife's a minister uh, of about 13 years standing, and uh, she's presently the superintendent in Hexham. And I have to say, it's wonderful being back in Scotland. I left Scotland about 10 years ago, and it's wonderful coming back to familiar places. And this morning, I think seems quite pertinent to me, the readings uh, that we, we will be hearing this morning, the challenges of discipleship in the midst of the love of God. So as we have gathered together, let's face our Lord and our Savior as we approach to worship Him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father and Sustainer of all things, we thank you for the opportunity to gather today in this place of worship. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ here and elsewhere throughout the land. Help us to open our hearts and minds to you as we open your word through the scriptures and place our concerns at the foot of the cross. In your wonderful name, amen. And if, we, if you want to stand or sit, if you prefer, and uh, we will sing our first uh, song of praise to our Lord, O Thou Who Camest From Above, hymn number 625.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to discern what you would have us do in your life. what we have to do, what sacrifices we have to make, what challenges we must face as disciples in your wonderful creation. And Lord, we give thanks for this wonderful place of worship and for our friends and family and all those who help us to flourish throughout the week and throughout our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for your word, for the opportunity to grow closer to you, that we may flourish as individuals and that we may help our communities to flourish as a result. And Lord, we bring to you the things that we have said that perhaps we should not have said, the things that we have done that we should not have done the hurt that we have caused, intentionally or unintentionally. Lord, help us to grow into good disciples, better disciples, that people we encounter during our week will experience something of the love of Christ, something of your wisdom, offering them hope in the light of your love, in the hope and the sure knowledge of eternal life in your presence. And as we're gathered here today, we remember the words that our Lord and Saviour taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. We're now going to open up the scripture and I'd like to thank our readers this morning. I'm not sure who they are. Um, Oh, hello. (laughs) Thank you. Um, We're going to hear first reading and then a hymn and then a second reading. Thank you. First reading is taken from 2 Kings chapter 2, reading from verses 1 to 2, then 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 6 to 14. Elijah taken up to heaven. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on the way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then reading from verse 6. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing a place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me, when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father! The chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. 
Elisha then picked up Elijah's coat that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. And we'll continue worship in the next hymn, 533 from CH4, Will You Come and Follow Me? New Testament reading is taken from Luke chapter 9, reading from verses 51 to 62. Samaritan rejects Jesus. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Sumerian village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them all? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. Let you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Next hymn, 512, a chance to air your lungs after the COVID. To God be the glory, great things have been done.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As I said earlier, it's a joy and a privilege to be here with you this morning in this wonderful place of worship, opening Scripture together and exploring the challenges of discipleship a very relevant topic for our times, I think. And we're looking at the way that the three men in the Luke story were challenged, and at the way that Elisha responded to Elijah, who is blessed by God. Elisha is anxious to receive God's blessing in his life. But before we delve deeper into the Old Testament story of their lives in the context of discipleship, Let's have a look at the Luke reading we heard and the challenges facing those would-be followers who spoke with Jesus. The three who separately encounter Jesus are at a pivotal moment in their lives. Each has the opportunity to step into a deeper relationship with Christ, to flourish through his direct teachings of the love of God and all the promises that would follow. And it's at precisely that moment they are made aware of the cost of doing so. The first and third encounters involve the person approaching Jesus before being addressed by him. The first is warned that there is no safety of home or hearth. The third also approaches Jesus. I will follow you, Lord, but let me say goodbye to my family. And I've always viewed Jesus' response as being very harsh. If we look back, we're not fit for service in the kingdom of God. And the second encounter differs from the other two in that the man is approached by Jesus who invites the man to follow him. But the man wants to press the pause button while he goes back to bury his father. And Jesus responds, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Encounters with the living Christ invite controversy, challenge, and sacrifice on a large scale. What's going on in this encounter? How can those encounters in Luke be relevant to our context today as we stagger out of a global pandemic at a time when across the vast majority of Christian denominations around the world, we see reduced church attendances, reduced memberships, new encounters with the living Christ various Christian denominations considering enter into partnership with others. And indeed, I had the joy and the privilege of being invited to my first Kirk session here last week, where issues of denominations working together were discussed. The former lawyer in me delighted in the challenges of written constitutional shuffling to accommodate the institutional regulations for all. But the true joy and excitement for me in all of that was that I could feel God's presence, God's love in the conversations, as scary as such conversations might be to people at times. But I am digressing slightly. Going back to the question, how are those challenging encounters in Luke relevant to our context today? The cost of discipleship seems unrealistically high and even perhaps unfair when we consider Christ's response to the three men. Don't follow Christ if you like living in a house with a bed in it. Don't follow Christ if you want to bury your family members. Don't follow Christ if you want to pop back home to say goodbye. The responses seem overly onerous and painful, running counter to the God of love and grace, certainly the God of love and grace that I know, the one for whom we gather our communities together so we can sing our praises 
and worship him. Now, all Christians will have encountered Christ at some point in their lives, but in different places and in different circumstances, in ways that are obvious or perhaps take many years for people to fully see and understand. But what is common to all Christian personal testimony is encounter, experiencing Christ through the Holy Spirit who works in and amongst and through us. And we continue to have encounters that enable us to grow and to flourish as Christians. That is in large part the point of our regular worship, prayer, both gathered and private, community worship or private retreats. And at that initial encounter of coming to faith, as it's often described as, we're often tentative. What does faith in Christ, the living God of love, grace and mercy, actually mean for me, for you? I do not think it means hitting the self-destruct button, as it might have sounded to the three men in their encounters with Jesus, as described in Luke. It does mean being honest with ourselves in our individual circumstances and contexts. I think this is where the sacrificial nature of following Christ flows from. So often we do things because that's the way we have always done them. More often than not, it means fitting our faith around our daily lives, going to work to service a mortgage, feed our families, food on the table, all the things that we need to do to get us through the week, the month, and the year. But Jesus is asking us to look deeper inside ourselves. We all came here today from different contexts and different circumstances. The call Christ asks us to answer is specific and it is unique to each of us. My responses will not be the same as yours. And it's not that we have to turn our backs on the everyday things that we are familiar with and the people we love. It is about discernment, praying into what it is that God wants from each of us, given that we are all made in God's image, given that we have all been given gifts by God to enable us to flourish in our lives. Now, I have a particular love of the Old Testament stories. At the start of lockdown, I contracted uh, the virus a couple of years ago, and it took me about two months to get out of it, and my head recovered quicker than my body. So I taught myself biblical Hebrew, and I've been going through the Old Testament, and I've been, I've been seeing them in a slightly different light. There's something gritty, and there's something clear, and in the Hebrew language, there's something quite repetitive about the themes that we read about in the stories. Reading something of the lives of Elijah and Elisha helped me to make sense of my own life of faith with the living God. For example, in 1 Kings 19, verses 19 to 21, we're told about the call of Elisha. Elijah finds him plowing in a field, and Elijah walks up to him and throws his cloak around Elisha's shoulders. Elisha then leaves his oxen and he runs after Elijah. But then when El 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 Elisha says to Elijah, let me kiss my mother and father goodbye and I will come with you, Elijah scolds him. But El Elisha responds by killing his cattle and burning the plow and cooking the meat to eat. He is very zealous, is Elisha. And in today's Two Kings reading, we see more of his loyalty towards the prophet Elijah as he stays by his side wherever he goes. Gilgal to Bethel, Bethel to Jericho, Jericho to the river Jordan. There is a zeal in him. He knows what he needs to do. His zeal for the Lord as he has been following God's servant and learned from him reveals that his calling was indeed to follow in Elijah's footsteps. And then, he, of course, he sees Elijah ascending to heaven. What does Elisha do? He rips his own cloak in two. He picks up Elijah's cloak, touches the surface of the water in the River Jordan, and the waters part to the right and to the left. And the point of this is that the sacrifice of following Jesus causes pain when we do not discern 
correctly, the call of God on our lives. Can you imagine what Elisha would have been feeling like if he'd stayed with his plow? We may rightly call ourselves Christians, experiencing Christ through the Holy Spirit, but our response is critical if we are to flourish fully, fully in our lives and thus enable others to flourish, to enable others to experience the love of Christ. Now, the Methodist Church, as you may know, encourages sharing personal testimony to enable us to see the direction we are heading in with God. It can offer encouragement to others, and it can serve to help us to correct ourselves when we're perhaps steering in the wrong direction. And I recall my first encounter with Christ. A young lad growing up in Elgin in the 70s, I attended a new thing called Sunday School in the local Episcopal Church. It was the only thing going. I would walk by the ruins of Elkin Cathedral on my way to and from the church hall. And one summer's day, I was resting on my back in the long grass where wildflowers were, flowers were growing next to the ruins. I could see and hear the birds in the sky and the soporific sound of crickets in the grass. And it was there in that moment that I experienced the closeness of Christ in my life. I felt timeless after that delighting in early relationship with Jesus, reveling in the long walks along the Murrayshire beaches, learning to fish from the harbour walls, chattering away with him by my side. And that presence, though, became more distant as the storms of life enveloped me. When I was about 14, I gave my father a pair of socks for his birthday. It was mid-November. He had to go away that night, and I walked into his car. I can remember it, a rusty old red Saab. I don't know if you remember the old Saab. I can still see the pair of socks strewn on the back shelf of the, of the car, surrounded by crumpled birthday paper. I never knew if he actually liked the socks. The next day, I was called into the head teacher's office to be told that my father had died of a massive heart attack in the middle of the night. And my challenges grew as I found myself living in a bedsit in Edinburgh in the years prior to starting studies at Edinburgh University. My sense of Christ's presence faded dramatically. And then one day, I made my way to a park bench at Inverleith Park in Edinburgh. It was a real pea super of a day. You couldn't see the hand in front of you. I just sat on the bench and the floodgates opened wide. The storms of life were pressing so down, so hard down on me, I did not know which way to turn. And through my anguish, the outline of a tall man cut through the dense fog, and he stood in front of me. And he took off his long, thick, naval duffel coat, and he wrapped it around my shoulders, and I felt an immediate comfortable warmth surge through my body. And he said, you need this more than I need it. And then he turned around as I sat before him, and he stepped into the mist, which swallowed him up. I never saw him again. I feel blessed to have experienced moments of encounter with God. The summer meadow, the beach, the fishing, the kindness of a stranger. And over the years that followed, I strained, really strained hard to respond properly to God. I engaged with lots of charity work outside my professional working life. And it was only when I was asked about my sense of calling that I began to step back to the place of godly encounter I experienced in the ruins of Elgin Cathedral and on the Mauritia beaches. The cost of discipleship, and part of it is that we're called to look after ourselves. We're called to work out where we are closest to God. How can we look after others if we're not healthy within ourselves? We should always be on the lookout for that thin place, that place of encounter with the risen Christ for our nourishment to guide us on the next phase of life's journey. I think the church fathers understood the meaning of the thin place in that context. If you've visited Iona or Lindisfarne or Pluscarden or any other place, perhaps you might have experienced the thin place, the place of really intense encounter or perhaps a quiet moment with God. 
And when, when I was completing the Monroes many years ago now, there were a number of outdoor encounters with the thin place, notably a sunset on top of the Buchel and a New Year's Day on the deep snow-covered summit of Maulunde at sunset, and the snow and sky merged in deep hues of orange and purple, taking me with them into that liminal space. If I had not pursued those places where I could recognize an encounter with Christ, I would not have received the spiritual nourishment I needed to flourish as a person in my relationship with Christ and in my relationships in community, both in the church and in the secular world. But that place is different for all of us. And we can see when people have responded to the call. For example, the sacrifices of time and resourceful that faithful, gifted people of God make for the church, for charity and local communities. At the Kirk session here last week, I enjoyed looking at the children's pictures on the walls as people were going through the, the agenda. Um, I have to confess I was looking at the, at the pictures. Um, and they gave a colorful visual expression of a love of God's beautiful, beautiful creation a world made for and gifted to us to protect and enjoy so that we can flourish in life, in our personal relationships and in our relationships with God. Things don't happen, though, unless people make the arrangements. Hall bookings, maintenance, legal observance, and all the rest of those things. Every job that you can think of that sustains our places of worship involves commitment, time, resources, and I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir largely on that, because people do put so much time into their churches. Sacrifices in the moment where the response to God's call is to further God's purposes. And this is one of the reasons why I was excited to be on placement in the Fourth Valley, to listen to the conversations between denominations, local ecumenical partnerships, invitations, or whatever legal language we might care to adopt every person within the conversation offering the gifts that God has given them. It's exciting, scary even, but God is at the center of it all. And the pain of sacrifice truly occurs when we do not listen to what God has equipped us with as individuals, and we push God to the side. For me, it's taken more than half a lifetime going from lawyer to tutor to primary school teacher, all of which led me to a life which immerses me fully uh, into God. In all those roles, in all those other journeys of my life, I think I was much like Elijah, fleeing from God's call. I think a few weeks ago or last week we had that story of him run running away from Jezebel's army. And it was painful. I can relate to Elijah more readily than I can relate to Elisha, as Elisha seems so resolute on his path from the get-go. But we are all different, and that's good. Our faith journeys are utterly different from each other. If we feel we're not in the right place with God in our lives, think of Elisha following Elijah from place to place. It's noteworthy that only Elisha saw Elijah ascending into heaven not the 50 who were watching from a distance, those from the company of prophets. They offer to go and look for Elijah in the wilderness because they haven't seen him ascending in the, in the, in the, in the uh, storm. Their faith journeys were different to Elisha's. Their callings will have been unique to them, just as your callings and God-given gifts are unique to you. But their gifts were not as Elisha's. They could not see what was not theirs to see. And when we get our alignment with God wrong, the responses Jesus gives to the three men in the Luke story sound hard and unloving, but they are really not. It is the pain of following the path that does not align with God's purposes for us that we read about in the story that's hard. I will finish with Elisha. After he sees the chariots of fire and Elijah ascending to heaven in the whirlwind, Elisha rips his own cloak in two. He picks up Elijah's cloak and he uses it to touch the water. And the river Jordan parts to the left and it parts to the right. Ripping up his own cloak, he gives up his old life. And with Elijah's cloak, 
assumes the role and responsibilities of his new life, one that is in true alignment with God's purposes for him. So I will leave you with a question. On your faith journey, and you know, you might not actually be on one at the moment, but if you're not, you can still ponder the question I would invite you to. On your faith journey or journey, have you ripped up your old cloak, let go of your old self, as Elisha did, and picked up your new cloak, the one that God would have you wear, where you are in a place of exercising your God-given gifts for God's purposes? Or are you still in the process of ripping up your old cloak and not sure where the new life God is calling you to actually is? And as we move into a new post-pandemic world of uncertainty, and perhaps especially in our church lives, it's worth remembering that our calling is to love and worship God, to love our brothers and sisters, and to flourish as individuals and in community with God firmly at the center. With God at the center, we will flourish when we stand together and not apart. Amen. If we'd like to stand or sit if you prefer, and we'll sing hymn number 502, 502, Take My Life, Lord, Let It Be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your church, and we pray for church leaders throughout the land. We pray for the church leaders throughout the world who work 
to bring your name into local communities, that the name of Christ will flow into people's ears, into their minds, and into their hearts. And Lord, in these times of fast information, help us to calm down, help us to listen to you, help people who are rushing around pause and hear the good news that you have to offer them through your people, through your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, we pray for the secular community around us. We pray for leaders in local authorities, in districts, at national level, and leaders around the world. We pray, Lord, that they will be filled with your wisdom, that they will experience something of your courage and an abundance of your love. We pray for those gathering at the G7 summit, that the right decisions will be made that align with your purposes for your people, people made in your image, that we may grow together in harmony and in love with you at our center, that we may understand that the cost of discipleship is alignment, listening for the things that you have given us, the gifts that you have given all of us. Lord and sustainer of all things, we pray for the victims of violence throughout the world. We pray for the victims of shootings in America and more recently in Oslo and elsewhere. We pray that our legislators will act wisely and with compassion, enabling us all in society to flourish and live in peace and harmony, that we may focus on you at the center of our lives, that we may bring your life, your world to flourishment. Lord, we pray for those suffering as a result of the cost of living in this country. We give thanks for those people who sacrifice resources and time to help. But Lord, help our leaders to make decisions that give people dignity, give people encouragement and hope in the future. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we pray for the situation in Ukraine that a way will be found, a way to peace. You, Lord, who are no stranger to witnessing the conflict of it within your creation, from the beginning of Scripture we read of conflict. Lord, may we all understand that conflict is not the way, that we are all made in your image, that the sacrifice of discipleship is for is that we begin to understand that we are all in it together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, in a moment of quiet, we bring before you those known to us who suffer at this time in body and mind. God of love, be with them. Be with their carers. We pray that they will know your peace. They will know your love in times of anguish and pain. That our, our presence in their lives will remind them of your love and the promise of eternal life with you. In your wonderful name. Amen. And we will finish our sing songs of praise to our Lord and Saviour. Be Thou My Vision, hymn number 400.
and 65, 465. It has been a joy and a privilege to be with you this morning. Brothers and sisters in Christ, encouragement, togetherness, partnership in this wonderful, wonderful country. May the light of Christ shine on your path this week. May the Holy Spirit dwell within you and guide your mind and your hearts in your encounters with others. And may you flourish in your continuing discipleship with our Lord and Saviour. Amen. <laughs>